Great, I think we're live on YouTube as well. I think so. I'm just having the joy of seeing myself a couple of seconds behind uh, on a different medium. Great, I think we're live on YouTube as well. Great, I think so. Yes, um, having tested out the uh, live stream myself, I should just note that it maybe is about seven or eight seconds behind in lag. Um, I will say that again to, for, I don't know how many people are already in the live stream. Um, but, you know, when there's a case of answering questions and whatnot, bear with us if there's a short delay. <laughs> Uh, considering that um, everyone can possibly, <laughs> everyone who can possibly fit into the Zoom meeting is, uh, we're just going to get going straight away. Uh, but I suspect people will be joining the live stream in the next few minutes as well. I'm just going to share my screen. Go back to the beginning. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Richard. I am the head of the workshops team at the Cambridge University Science and Policy Exchange. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to uh, uh, this, uh, our last workshop of the second term of this <laughs> crazy academic year. Uh, this is our policy writing workshop. Uh, and I'll be telling you just a bit about how it works and uh, talking about introducing our speaker in just a moment. Just before we do that, a few brief housekeeping things. Um, please do keep yourself muted on Zoom when uh, we're not, when, if you're not speaking. Um, though, uh, in the interest of, of encouraging participation and collaboration, if you can have your video on, that would be great. Though we are aware that with so many people in the Zoom, um, for networking reasons, we might have to change that. But hopefully, uh, the, the, the connection will hold. Uh, most importantly, um, please do use the chat uh, you can contact, you can PM me, that's Richard Melange, or um, one of my, uh, one of the other people on the workshops team called the Cuspy Committee, um, if, if you need any help and we'll, we'll try and, you know, fix technical difficulties while uh, the main workshop takes place. Okay, um, we're currently in uh, the, the first point on our agenda, the introduction to Cuspy. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that uh, it's great, this, this uh, event is, going out uh, to a much wider range of, of people than, than normal. Usually we, we, we just have sort of um, some undergraduates and many PhDs and researchers from Cambridge, but um, this evening we're, we're pleased to be joined by people from all over the UK and I think um, even outside the UK as well. Uh, and, and that's really great. And that's definitely something that Cuspy wants to, wants to encourage, really wants to forge more partnerships with uh, other students at other universities interested in <laughs> broadly policy for science and science for policy. Um, just to, just to note, note the agenda more formally, um, I'll, I'll be introducing uh, Dr. K, I'll speak in just, just a moment um, and, and, and talk a bit, a bit about um, about him and he'll talk about his own uh give an introduction himself i'm sure we'll have a main session that'll be a you know about 50 minutes um in the main session please uh 
uh, while we have a Q and A at the end, we, we do we are interested in your, your insights during the session. Um, we're planning to have a, 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 a points through the session a few sort of stop stopping points, natural stopping points, uh, where we might have a little bit more of a discussion. We'll be looking for input, but equally, if if you feel there's sort of an urgent question, do pop it in the chat. But the main Q and A session will be afterwards, where really it will just be lots and lots of the questions in the chat, and I imagine I'll have to be <laughs> reading through them very fast and trying to trying to uh, pick. Out the ones for discussion. Uh, following feedback from uh, pr some previous workshops, we're, we're having an, an, a 90 minute workshop rather than two hours uh, this evening. But equally, if it went to 18:35, I, I don't think anything, anything too bad would happen, you know. Um, but we, we're trying to keep it slightly shorter, slightly more focused. Um, the goals are pretty self-explanatory from what you'd expect of a policy writing workshop. We want to learn how to how to write better and 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 what styles of writing are important in in this this policy context. Um, crucially, uh, Dr. K will be will be discussing, um, I think. Uh, touching on at least the difference between the sort of information that, that civil servants and, and ministers might, might want to receive and what they actually need to know and, and how to give that to them. Um, and uh, as um, you know, a high ranking member of the Government Office of Science, we'll be discussing a, bit, a little bit about their work. And as always, we hope you have lots of fun. I'll stop the share now and uh, introduce Dr. K. Uh, so Dr. K is, is Head of uh, International Res Resilience at the Government Office for Science. Um, a varied career, um, work science policy, speechwriter to UK ministers, uh, previously um, a, a PhD in history and, and some work in, in academia. Um, I'm trying to keep it brief. <laughs> I think I think I I've, I've exhausted everything I want to say, and I'm just going to hand over. <laughs> Thank you so much for join, joining us, Dr. K. Thanks very much, Richard, and uh, really good to um, be speaking to you tonight. I'm really pleased that uh, this is hopefully going out not just to people in Cambridge, but Cambridge students in other parts of the world and students from uh, other universities. Um, and good to see some faces at the top of the screen. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and hopefully um, bring up the first slide. Uh, excellent. Um, so uh, the purpose of my talk this evening is to suggest some ways uh, to you all to write more effectively and that's partly with government in mind with a view to influencing or, or working for government Partly it's with science in mind as the primary subject matter that I assume that you're all engaged in, but hopefully these tips will have some relevance to writing under any circumstances. And I'm gonna focus on five things today. Um, I've given this presentation a couple of times before, um, hard to believe that that was in person in Cambridge in a different life uh, prior to COVID, but COVID itself has emphasized in my mind the value of these five themes and they are uh, brevity, uh, storytelling and structure. Um, the third one is trying to sound like a real human being as opposed to a visitor from Planet Management Consultancy. Uh, the fourth is some techniques about writing uh, persuasively and then the uh, fifth is some basic elements of style and pizzazz. Um, as Richard said, I'm happy to take questions at any point, and there's some time for Q&A at the end. And uh, if you're able to use the chat, um, I can't see the chat at the moment, but um, Richard can uh, hopefully convey it to me uh, somehow. A um, couple of other things before I start. Um, this is not civil service doctrine that I'm... Uh, offering you today, it's, it's my own views. And I also want to dampen expectations a little by saying that none of what I'm going to talk through is, is rocket science. Um, so my starting point, I think, is generally that writing within government and in other sectors is pretty poor, and you don't have to do very much to stand out. Uh, and I think the most fundamental problem is that very little thought is given to the reader's knowledge levels, the time constraints they're under, uh, their attention span, 
and their ability to uh, interpret jargon or, or technical language. So my number one piece of advice to you all this evening is to get to know your audience and think about them at every point. Um, so what can I say about the government audience, um, particularly after um, a year of COVID? Um, that audience is, is weary, it's very short of time, and it most, although there are a lot of scientists working in the UK government, it mainly comprises generalists. So never, ever, ever assume that they, this audience, know as much about your subject as you do. And I think it's pretty fair to say that that's true of the general public as well. But equally, people in government, uh, like anybody, are responsive to writing that tells a story and contains a human dimension. And I'm going to try and keep coming back to the human dimension this evening. In particular, if you're in government, it's about how um, an idea or a new technological development can help make lives better, can make public services better for people. And like nearly everybody, what government values is clarity and simplicity. And that's apart from when government is trying to deliberately uh, obfuscate, but let's not go there. But clarity and simplicity for um, itself and for the citizens that it seeks to serve. So what does this actually mean in practice? Um, I'm now going to try and advance the next slide. Um, just while you Here do advance the slide, uh, Andrew, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, a minor technical thing, uh, it appears that uh, we managed to generate two different uh, YouTube links uh, that were both the live stream. Um, but we're, so I just want to apologize to those who joined the earlier wrong one um, and hopefully uh, you should all be transferring now. Sorry to interrupt, please do go on. Am I okay to continue, Richard? Absolutely, please do. <laughs> so the first one of my um, five themes is, is brevity. And the mantra here is that less is more. Less is always more. In government, there's a very strange phenomenon where every night ministers receive a red box full of very, very lengthy briefings. And that's partly a function of officials being unwilling or unable to stick to the essentials on paper. And you'll also see if you ever watch a parliamentary debate or a select committee hearing, that the minister is sat there with a massive file in front of them uh, tabulated to um, the nth degree, but they are unable to actually look at any of that information because it looks like that they haven't mastered their brief. So a key aspect of giving advice or catching government's attention is to be short and memorable. And so brevity is really the ability to prioritize and express yourself quickly and clearly. And it's a rare, a rare skill. So let me give you some tips. Uh, um, in relation to brevity. The first one is to prioritize, to deal with the essentials. There are political consultancies uh, peddling themselves around Westminster who charge lots and lots of money to blue chip companies uh, with advice that if you want to get something from the treasury, keep your um, request to one page and ask for one thing only. Um, now that is wise advice, but it's hardly earth shattering. But what I would suggest to you is that every piece of writing that you do would benefit from an explicit headline, even if you don't write it at the top of the page. So it might be, we have five years left to tackle climate change or we're doomed. Or it might be, social mixing at Christmas will be disastrous for um, the spread of infection. Or if it's your personal correspondence, happy birthday or sorry. So you can save yourself and the reader lots of time by planning what it is that you're actually writing about and sticking to that headline. If other subject matter slips in, which isn't relevant or appropriate, it might be happy birthday, mum, 
can I have some money? Um, it has to go. So that's one of your key filters. Or maybe that would work with your mum, but it's not going to work with a minister. Now, who are the masters of brevity? I think in, the, in this country, it's the tabloid press because they have the sort of ultimate headline mentality. And I just want to give you an example of what the sun is capable of. Now, this is an example from quite a few years ago now, but it made the front page of the sun. There was an important piece of research about cervical cancer and the causes of it. And this was the name of the paper that caused all the uh, media interest. And when the sun uh, had digested that paper, this was the headline that they came up with. It's very interesting. When this happened, uh, I was part of an event with scientists and science journalists, and the scientists could not argue with this headline as a representation of the content of that article. So write that headline for whatever you're seeking to achieve from a piece of writing and stick to it. But there are some other ways in which I can hopefully suggest you can um, weed out some waffle from your writing. So pithiness is a virtue. Short words are, to use a short word, good. So although you could say purchase, it's easier to say buy. Although you could endeavour, it's easier to try. Although you could remunerate, it's easier to pay. And I think the worst word that should never, ever appear in any writing ever is the word utilise, because there's this very nice little word use um, that covers every need that utilise might otherwise um, offer. So that's um, use short words. Next, try and avoid redundant words. There's a sort of truly madly deeply problem with some bits of writing. If people say it is vitally important, that is exactly the same as saying it is important. So you can look through your writing and just strike out those words that don't need to be there. Similarly, you don't need um, for the interest of the reader to um, vary words, use synonyms just to keep them interested. If it's something to do with cars, you don't need to talk about vehicles, automobiles, jalopies, sedans as well. Just keep it simple. Also, I would suggest that you seek to write in the active voice. The active voice, an example is, I shot the dog, as opposed to the passive voice, which, was, which is, the dog was shot by me. As well as being generally better, uh, because the active voice is more direct and it shows who's taking responsibility for something, those sentences are also shorter. And you may notice that powerful people tend to use the active voice when they want to take credit, but the passive voice when they're trying to pass the buck onto somebody else. And finally, under this heading, I would suggest to you to round up numbers. There are some cases where um, numbers after the decimal place are important, but generally not in a big ticket or simple pieces of writing where you're trying to convey an issue. And rounded numbers are also more memorable. So, uh, Richard, I can't see any of the chat while I'm in this mode, but have any kind of questions or comments come in at this point that you would like me to pick up on? Not immediately on the Zoom chat, uh, and I'll, I'll get someone else to, to check the YouTube chat. But, yes, do, do okay. put in thoughts, and that's fine. <laughs> fine. In which case, I will carry on to the second theme, which is about storytelling, because brevity on its own isn't likely to pique anybody's interest. For that, you need stories. And I would suggest to you that what you need more than stories is stories involving people. Uh, and the stories that use tried and tested structures. Um, what you often find in government, or the most common question that people ask themselves is, What's our story around this policy? Or because they're incapable of short, using short words like stories, uh, what is our narrative here? And I think there's a basic human truth that we all 
need stories. Um, they, make, they help us make sense of our world. They help us process and remember information. And they're drummed into us from almost from birth with fairy tales, fables, parables, precautionary tales. And all story forms have very specific structures. A fairy tale starts with once upon a time and it ends with um, the hero or heroine living happily ever after. Every romantic comedy you've watched at the cinema or on Netflix starts with a disastrous first meeting, uh, then a slightly better second meeting, uh, followed by a good period, followed by an absolute crisis where the relationship is in serious jeopardy and then there is a satisfactory resolution at the end. And I could go through other sorts of story form, soap operas, tragedies, newspaper profiles, economist articles, TV editorials, and they all follow a very particular structure. The next time you watch Laura Koonsberg on the BBC News, when she's standing outside 10 Downing Street, you'll see that she will use pretty much the same structure for her 45 seconds to camera every single night. So at a broad level, we might think of what the government story is or the standard government story is. And it tends to be, we inherited a dismal situation from our predecessors, but we're going to do things better. We're gonna make everybody proud. We're gonna stand out as a nation and the future is going to be wonderful. And there I've essentially given you the template for every ministerial speech that I ever wrote or was ever requested. But what would be helpful to hear from you is what you think are the key ingredients of a good science story. And if people would want to write something in the chat, what are the elements of a science story? And perhaps I'll come out of my screen sharing so I can hopefully see what people are writing. I mean, I'll suggest a couple of things to you uh, as, as you're thinking, but um, there's the idea, ah, excellent. Caroline's already talked about um, a protagonist, um, personal connections, new discoveries, solutions to a problem, acknowledging uncertainty, urgency, a hypothesis, analogies, evidence. Excellent. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, so, yeah, I think those are the, the essential elements that you often have. Uh, a, there's, there's an emphasis often on progress, on improving people's lives, getting from A to B. And I'm quite encouraged that people have mentioned um, the scientists themselves as, as part of this. So, on the assumption that you are all um, scientists, I think it's worth thinking about the story you want to tell about the science you do. And you've probably thought in the past about other stories of you, about how you when you were applying to get into university or to get work experience. And it's good to think about the story that you would want to tell about the research that you do or the science that you're interested in. And again, remember your audience. If you're writing for government, you do not want some kind of impenetrable Christopher Nolan plot. You do not want to give them a cliffhanger. You're not in the position where you can say, I'll write to you again, next week with the next instalment of my research proposal. This isn't East End Enders. You want something that's quick and clear and interesting. So what I would suggest to you is that the most natural structure that you can adopt and copy, um, which makes sense for government and has a very, very clear structure is news. Because news stories are a very methodical way of conveying information 
and users know exactly what they should deliver. It's an essential ranking of um, essential information. It's very um, brisk in style because the reader's in a hurry and the key stuff comes first, the headline. And so news has a lot of essential presumptions built in that the reader won't know anything about what, what you're explaining and that they won't read everything so that you have to put the really important stuff near the top of the story. And you have to answer the key questions that following the news trains us to ask. That's the who, the what, the when, the where, the why. And if you go to journalism school, you'll probably see something that looks a bit like this, the upside down pyramid, where you are front loading the piece of writing with the essential information that you need. Now, in the case of science, in addition to the who, what, where, when, and why, and often in, in news articles, there'll be a so what as well, that the, um, the editor will bring to bear or the, the expert or the uh, sort of guest columnist. With science, you may often need to deal with the how, the how long and how much it costs or how much of a difference that it makes. Um, so it's about the process and the duration and the method. Now, what are the implications of using uh, the news structure, the news story structure to frame your writing? I think the main one is this, that if you can't answer all of these questions, you're probably not ready to press send on your piece of work. Uh, it, it's not quite finished yet. And so you can use this structure to your benefit. You can use it to know whether you've answered all the questions, but it can also help you decide what to include, what to leave out, what needs to go first in that piece of writing you're doing. And it may be helpful to know that within the UK government, at least, the, the standard way of engaging with ministers is, is a document called a ministerial submission. It's a briefing paper or a guidance paper. And it's very, very formulaic, a bit like a new structure. And if these submissions to ministers are well-crafted, they do follow this upside down triangle of news. They're telling the minister who has just discovered that in an hour's time, he's got a one-to-one -one meeting with the prime minister. This is the, the, these are the things that you absolutely must say and get across to the prime minister in the time that you have with him. So structure really should be everywhere because it helps carry the reader with you. It helps ensure that they understand everything. It helps you anticipate the questions that they might have. And the next point I want to make is that structure is not only um, relevant to the overarching um, way in which you set out a piece of writing, but on every page of it and on every paragraph of it. So you know, the purpose of a paragraph really is to convey a single idea and to back it up by evidence. So another test that you can do on a piece of writing of yours is look at every paragraph. If the first sentence of the paragraph and the last sentence of the paragraph are about different things, that is a failing paragraph. If you've not evidenced the um, proposition or the idea that you've put for, forward in the first sentence of that paragraph, it also fails. So you can use that um, to, um, to stay on track with your writing and use that headline test. If the content doesn't relate to the headline, it has to go. You know, digression is for fiction, for um, conversations with your friends in the pub. And I've seen sort of very clear evidence of this over the last 14 months, which the whole time of which I've spent uh, 
in the SAGE Secretariat in Go Science, working on COVID and drafting minutes of, of SAGE meetings, which you may have looked at uh, online. Uh, so in the last, uh, since January last year, SAGE has produced over 80 sets of minutes and hundreds and hundreds of other papers. Um, and in every single one of those documents, the crucial bit is the executive summary, because that's the bit that people have time to read. That's where we've gone to the effort of summarizing, um, of praising um, some quite technical content as best we can for our customers in government, who are the ones who have to take the advice from SAGE and turn that into policies, whether that's around um, vaccinations or uh, lowering R or lifting restrictions or whatever it might be. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? Um, we have. Oh. <coughs> oh. oh, I'm sorry. sorry. You, you go, please. Yeah, sorry. It's Madeline here. Um, I did have a question, but I was a little bit late to put it on because it was for the brevity side. Um, That's okay. And I was just wondering, when you have a paragraph, I, I get the whole the paragraph with the one idea and one backup, that's fine. But if you have to use the same word over and over again, like you, you use the example of cars, for example, or utilize or things like this, that if you have to use that same word in the same paragraph several times, does it not become annoying for the reader? Uh, to have it in there and so are you not best placed to use a synonym in those in, in those situations? That, that, that's, a, that's a very fair challenge Madeline. If, if I was writing a speech uh, and I wanted to keep the audience interested or I was writing something a bit more creative I, I would seek to um, elaborate you know to, to try and uh, vary the language I was using. But if um, my main objective is to convey really important information to a senior person or just a reader in the shortest space of time, I wouldn't worry too much about that sort of repetition problem. Uh, and, you know, that's where um, abbreviations and initialisms can, can come in as well. Um, I don't think in, in the sort of writing that I've been focusing on so far, where you're just trying to cover something in a couple of pages, I don't see that as a big issue. Okay. Not even for ministerial submissions and, and programme board documents? Certainly not for a ministerial submission. If, if, if you think from their perspective, it's half past 10 at, lo at night and they've got 30,000 words to read, they want to just hoover through that, speed read it, and they're not thinking at any point, gosh, this, um, this civil servant has a fine literary style. I wonder whether I, I'd like to read more of her. They just want to go to bed or whatever else they, they, <laughs> else they have on, I would suggest. Okay, fair enough. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that excellent first question. Um, we do have a couple of others. Um, I'll just say them all quickly. Um, so there was another one um, about brevity and someone was asking how to balance brevity with their own bias. Um, and they felt, yeah, the question was, how do you balance brevity with your own bias? And then there were, other, there were two others, which were about policy, about briefings. One person, uh, Denise asked if you were able to send us an example ministerial brief. I don't know whether that's possible. And Caroline asked, have you got an example of how digression ruined a policy briefing? So gravity versus bias, possible brief and digression ruining briefings. Thanks, Richard. So on brevity and bias, I'm not 100% sure what the question is driving at, but one of the things about the civil service, and I don't know if it's true of academia anymore, but the civil service is very, very hierarchical it's quite rare that you write something and then press send and it goes straight to the minister. It has to be approved by various other levels. And so if there is bias in what you've put down on the page, 
that tends to be picked up by somebody else. Um, and I don't think brevity is the enemy of bias because, you know, within a short document, you should at some, you know, where appropriate be saying um, country X's approach to um, quantum computing is this, country Y's is this. Our view is that country Y's is the one that we should follow. So I don't think brevity is something that then rules out um, allowing diversity of thought into, into a piece of writing. Uh, on the ministerial brief, let me check on that and maybe Richard could remind me at the end of this to see whether that can be shared. Um, an example of digression that has sunk, well, I, I can't give you a specific example, but imagine what, what you often want from a submission to a minister is to get the go ahead. And if you said something to the minister and you've put something in there as well about a slightly different subject and she gets all excited about subject B and then her feedback is about that, then you have failed to get the clearance or the, the steer you wanted on, on, on the main thing. And again, it's, it's just about, although there are some people who are really sort of superhuman and have the ability to churn through massive amounts of work and keep many different issues in the front of their mind, what you really want to do with the sub a submission is to concentrate them on that one single issue because there are other ways in which you can talk about if, if, if you want to get their their steer on a number of things that's probably better for have for a conversation rather than putting something in writing um hope that's uh reasonably helpful i will go back to um the uh, the presentation. So, let's see. Let's move on to our third theme. Now, here I would suggest to you that communication is tricky at the best of times, and hence the misunderstandings we might have with our friends or family or uh, with bureaucrats. And so, where language itself is confusing or actually completely meaningless, the chance for misunderstanding is greater. And jargon is a great problem in government and elsewhere. And uh, this is somewhat out of date now, but while I was a speechwriter, I compiled what I refer to as my dossier of drivel. Uh, and I'd like to show you um, a bunch of words that uh, in different categories that I think Add very little value to any piece of writing. Uh, so we have the stuff that's just worn out, um, which you should just feel deeply cynical about. Um, vision is an example. A vision in my book is something that a biblical figure has uh, when they are communing directly with a higher power. And when a minister or anybody tells you that they're passionate about something, Think about what passion meant in the context of the Bible. It was the willingness to die. So if somebody says, I'm passionate about making sure that beavers repopulate our rivers uh, in a ministerial post that they're only in for about five minutes, is it really the case that they're willing to die for those beavers? Um, now, I could go through all of these, but um, what I guess my question is, again to you and would welcome some thoughts in the chat or possibly some people um, speaking is, um, does this strike you as a legitimate list or am I being unfair or unreasonable? Um, because my experience is that a lot of this stuff is just the emperor's new clothes really. It's not um, giving value to your writing. Um, there's a point at which when you're told that every single new bit of technology is going to be transformational, uh, you don't really believe it anymore. So I'd really welcome people's thoughts again. Hello, uh, it's Madeline again. Um, I have to say, I think I probably would, it would depend on what you're writing uh, and what your subject is. 
because, for example, a lot of uh, the work that I do is, in actual fact, evidence based, <laughs> and a lot of it is going forwards. So, um, uh, some of the not all of them, but some of the words in there, we actually do need to use to describe uh, our policy area. So I think it might depend on what your area is as to whether the words are relevant, not as the words themselves. Well, I'm glad you mentioned the old evidence-based one. Um, if, if you've been in government a while, the, the cynic in me might say there is a difference between evidence-based policy making and policy-based evidence making. But you really would hope that uh, there is evidence behind anything that a government does or a company does, um, that they're not just um, plucking initiatives out of the sky. So um, what I would much rather see is the evidence rather than the promise that this is evidence-based. So if there was a sentence that said, we have surveyed 1500 people before we came up with this, um, with this idea, I'm absolutely fine with that. But a promise of evidence-based um, policy making that then doesn't deliver the proof is where I tend to get a bit suspicious. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks. Just to say, um, there have been lots of excellent questions in the chat. Um, some of them, I'm, we're all noting them down and some of them will be moved back to the Q&A session. I think they're more general. Um, this is also for the live stream. Please do bring in your questions too. Um, but a couple that came through uh, just now, Andrew, that might be relevant right now. Um, Joanna asks about, you know, if, if ministers are using this, and maybe civil sense are using this jargon, isn't there a, a value in also using it to sort of fit into that context and maybe better inform? Um, and Ian asks whether metaphors are useful or to be avoided. Um, Joanna, that's a very fair challenge. And we all sort of want to fit in at some point or other. And I'm probably guilty, as guilty as anyone, of using all of these words at different points in my, um, in my career. Um, yes and no. I think the risk often happens that you use some language, a lingua franca, internally, and then you forget, forget to switch that off when you're trying to appeal to the general public. And they have no idea what you're talking about because they're not part of the the bubble. Um, and so uh, it's okay to have within a lab, um, you know, a team, a, a language, a shorthand, but then you have to be so rigorous to make sure that you don't then just transmit that externally, because then you're going to lose the people that you're trying to appeal to. Um, metaphors, Ian, if, if it's all right, I'm going to come back to that quite shortly. So I'll, I'll cover that in a moment and um, return again to the presentation. I mean, I think my main message here is that what we should write, what we write really must be readily comprehensible to the widest possible audience. So nobody should be put off reading because of trumped up or opaque language. Clarity really is not the lowest common denominator, but a supreme achievement. And a pandemic is a really good example. I've been involved in discussions recently where the challenge has come in that if you're going to explain the vaccine to everybody, should you be doing it not in words, but pictorially, so that there is even less risk of people misinterpreting what is absolutely critical um, public health advice. So some basic suggestions on the back of this. Never assume that the reader knows as much as you. Ask yourself always whether a lay person could follow the content or would they switch off? Ask yourself, am I using unnecessarily technical language? And if the language is necessary, that technical language, have I bothered to explain it properly? And a few other points. Move this on. I really encourage you to talk about people wherever you can. 
people as doers, people as beneficiaries, not people as units or as sort of human fodder. An example here is something that's a very popular phrase in government, the STEM pipeline. You people, I guess, are the STEM pipeline, but it's nicer to be thought of as scientists and people who will make individual contributions in the future rather than the people who just are needed to make an industry um, thrive in the future. And I would suggest to you that scientists are human beings, they are people. We live in a culture where the only two, I think, who are recognised as having uh, personal uh, backstories that are interesting are Stephen Hawking and Alan Turing, but they're not the only people. Um, and one of my favourite things to listen to is uh, Jim Al-Khalili's um, show on Radio 4, which is also a podcast called The Life Scientific. It's a fantastic show. I don't know if people listen to it, but you get to hear about the scientist as a whole person, um, what drove him or her to the research they did, where their curiosity came from, some of the sort of more um, practical human aspects of being a scientist. And I think also that human story is what gets people interested in science. I, I will admit to you that the Higgs boson uh, and its discovery is of little interest to me. Well, sorry, the, the particle itself means nothing to me, but the discovery, the idea of a man, uh, Peter Higgs, waiting years and years and years for validation of his extraordinary uh, thesis it is amazing. And that's why I would put money on Tom Hanks or Russell Crowe being Peter Higgs in some cheesy movie in a few years time. So I really want to stress the importance of the human side. And this is really essential when you're blogging, when you're doing public outreach, because I would argue that science and scientists are a mystery to the general public. Um, whereas academic conferences are of no interest to the general public. You as individuals are interesting. There's huge interest at the moment around the people that develop the BioNTech vaccine or the Oxford vaccine. Who are these men and women? How did they do it? What did they study? Um, so focus on the human side. A couple of other things. One, spell out initialisms first time, unless they are beyond obvious. Um, people that don't and neglect this, it's generally a sign of the author's laziness or their tribalism. So the beyond obvious list of initialisms is really, really short. And in fact, it's only when an initialism becomes an acronym, i.e. a word in its own right, that you should allow this to go through. So AIDS, NATO, COVID. Um, those you can rely on people understanding, but other things explain what they are. And then finally, I would really encourage you, and this is the point about um, metaphors, to try and compare things to everyday life uh, or to daily life. Um, work, food, leisure, sport, family. Um, some of you may have become aware during the pandemic of the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Jonathan Van Tan. He's been fantastic, I think, in the daily press conferences because he's compared uh, the challenges of reducing infection um, and the R number to football or to, you know, a penalty shootout and things like this. Uh, I think it's really, really important to render stuff that can be quite difficult in other terms. And just wanted to show an example to you uh, where I think this has been done really well. It's a warning about um, artificial intelligence and um, deep fat fryers is the uh, analogy here. So I'll shut up for a sec and give you a chance to read that. Okay, I'll now move on to the fourth uh, area I wanted to cover this evening, which is persuasion. 
And all of you as consumers will probably not find any of these uh, unfamiliar. Um, these are ways in which you can boost your argument, and some of them will be more relevant to particular types of media. But anyway, here is the list. The first is a confession or a concession. This is where, uh, and this features a lot in, in speeches, where uh, somebody seeking public office will admit, uh, I may not have been the perfect husband or wife in the past. Yes, I have erred. Yes, I have made mistakes, but I have learned from those mistakes. So a confession when it comes to a bit of writing for government is to say, uh, we tried, we had the best intentions with this policy, but it didn't work. And now we think there is a way of doing it better. It sets up what your better proposal is. The second one is, is, is definitely for speeches, but it's where you want the reader either um, silently or vocally, if you're speaking to a large audience, to say yes. Uh, Donald Trump was a master, is a master, at uh, riling up an audience uh, and putting out those points that he knows they will agree with. The third one, uh, I think, may be more useful to you. Uh, it's good versus evil or good cop, bad cop. It's usually quite helpful to um, point out what is the enemy uh, in any situation, who are the baddies, and to contrast yourselves with them. So it may be other countries who are uh, terrible polluters and we do not want to uh, behave in the same way as them. It may be um, uh, people who miss deliberately misrepresent the science uh, and cause terrible problems. And essentially you are contrasting what you are seeking to do against um, what others are attempting to do. The fourth one here is urgency. If you've ever watched an advert on TV, let's take the example of World of Leather Sofas. The World of Leather Sofas advert always has an offer that ends on Friday. That's because they are trying to make you think, I have no time to lose here. So the corollary uh, when you're trying to write something is, uh, what I'm suggesting here needs to be implemented tomorrow or else the consequences are disastrous or less than optimal. So time constraints is what you're really emphasizing there. The fifth one is uh, authority. Um, ministers, senior people, anybody would like to hear that um, scientist X uh, agrees with this point that you are putting forward, or there is a consensus view from the Royal Society or wh whatever it may be about the value of uh, face masks in limiting transmission during COVID. So where is your, um, who else is in the same position as you? And the last one is proof, it's the evidence. Eight out of 10 cats prefer whiskers or kitty cat or whatever it is. Um, hopefully you will have a better sample size than kitty cat or oil of ule when you present your evidence, but that proof is really, really critical. Any questions before um, I go to the last bit? Um, there are many questions, um, but just before, I think I think there was someone with their, their hand up uh, at the last stopping point, we didn't quite get to them. So if uh, Lane or, or Martin could, could unmute um, uh, Shayla, uh, they might still have a question they wish to ask. Actually, I've done it. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that opportunity, but he's he's answered my question. Oh, brilliant. Um, Thank you so much. In that case, um, again, there are still a few that I'm, I'm putting to the end. Um, we were perhaps going to have a discussion of 
metaphors, acronyms, and now also abbreviations, e.g., i.e., for example, uh, whether you wanted to touch on any of those. E.g. E and I.E. are fine. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, metaphors, was, was there a specific question? I think the example from Ian was move the needle. Um, move the needle sounds to me personally a bit more like, um, uh, gosh, it's getting late, but that's, that doesn't really bring something to life. Um, that's sort of uh, modern parlance, but it, it's not a metaphor. I'll give you an example of a metaphor that I wanted to get into speeches, but I always had a failure of nerve at the end. Lyndon Johnson, president of the US in the 1960s, once said that pissing down your own leg, it feels hot to you, but not to anybody else. Now, that may be a bit extreme as a metaphor, but it's trying to um, bring an issue to life. And um, I think, you know, phrases like move the needle is just, um, my guess is that that's come from management speak at some point, unless somebody tells me otherwise. Then some recent questions on uh, just some of the bullet points you had um, from Justin, and I'll, I'll go through them a few more, um, on authority, um, what if you get some new research that maybe challenges the current consensus and it might be sort of considered, the way I'm interpreting it, is sort of high risk, high reward. You could get significant gains if you put it in, but it's, it's, it's sort of new and unusual and, and different to the idea be ideas before. That was mm. Well, I think, you know, one of the main responsibilities of a civil servant is if the story changes, if the evidence changes, you, you don't sit on it, you tell the minister, uh, you, you tell the senior person. Um, in those sort of high risk, high reward scenarios, or in, in my world, um, so, something like um, low risk, high consequence, um, threat to the UK, um, there you really want to put as much evidence in, into the submission or the advice you're giving to the minister as possible, because ultimately they're making the judgment and, and you want to give them as, as well formed a picture as, as you possibly can. And then from Joanna, also on authority and proof, um, do ministers need to see references? Are they worried about a list of sources or is that unhelpful? Probably scientists do, uh, ministers less so. What tends to happen as people try to cut work down is that they start creating annexes and then very quickly you've got 15 annexes because you're too loath, reluctant to cut stuff out. Um, here, I think it depends on, on, on the minister. Some people are voracious. So I remember something that was said by Barack Obama's chief scientist, uh, John Holder, and he was called. He said that Obama was the most scientifically engaged president since Thomas Jefferson. And what we heard about him was that th there was no limit to what Obama wanted to read himself. But other people are very different. So um, and I think I saw something else in the in the chat about this. A lot is tailored to the particular requirements of of a minister. So I worked quite a lot for um, David Willits when he was science minister and he wanted to read everything. But other people are, are, are quite different and they want they want you to do the hard work for them. OK, I will cover the last um, theme and then we can go into a summary and, and Q&A. The last theme uh, is, is pizzazz. What quick things can you do to make your writing fresher, more vivid, more enticing? Um, I've already stressed metaphors, but there are a few other things that you might do and referring to everyday life. First of all, examples. Science and technology 
and engineering should be an incredible resource for any kinds of writing. And as I've said, I think science is in a sort of heyday at the moment because of the, the virus and the fact that it is science that has come to the rescue. The only warning I would give here is try not to use examples that have been done to death. So I think um, Tim Berners-Lee, as amazing as he is, is not the only inventor uh, of renown in Britain over the last few years. Alexander Fleming and penicillin is starting to get a bit old hat. But it's also got to be relevant to the audience. Um, one of the things that um, quite a lot of people in government think is really going to switch on the British public is a very commonly um, stated achievement of UK science, which is that we rank, I think, second in the world on scientific citations. Now, scientific citations are not sexy in anybody's book. And I think what you really need to focus on are examples that are new or they confound expectation. They make you go, wow, and particularly have that human dimension in there. A couple of other suggestions for you. One is, um, so there are standard sort of rhetorical tricks that you can use. Um, one of which is the callback, which uh, comedians use all the time, but you can see in other sorts of writing. Um, you give an example, and then at the very end of what you're writing, you come back to that. So you're delaying the telling of the full story. And that example is the one that is carrying the weight of your argument. Um, in speeches, um, suffering people or dying people are fantastic for this. So you could, uh, Tony Blair used to do this and, and Gordon Brown as well. They would tell you at the start of their speech about somebody in a really bad uh, position. Perhaps they are a single parent on a low income and the world looks bleak. But then after you've set out all the policies to um, enable them to do further education, you come back to that individual and they're in a great job and their children are thriving. Um, and so think about that, the, an example that you don't just trot out once, but you come back to it, you save some of the, um, you know, the, the punchline on it for later on in your piece of writing. And then finally, another uh, classic um, bit of sort of rhetoric that works in lots of different circumstances is there is lots of assurance and elegance in threes. So this starts for us as children with Goldilocks and the three bears and the three little pigs. When the Gruffalo goes into the deep dark wood, he meets three animals and in fact, the rhythm of the Gruffalo for what it's worth is in threes. But then you'll find this end up in politics as well, whether it's liberty, equality and fraternity or friends, Romans, countrymen. Coming back to Tony Blair, when he stated his priority, he said it's education, education, education. It was never gonna be two educations or four educations. It had to be three. We are um, programmed in some way to talk about threes. Uh, the only caveat here is that um, it stands out a mile if every single one of your sentences uh, has three components to it. So use this um, sparingly. So I'll just summarize quickly and then um, open it up to questions. Um, I'd like to say again that good writing takes time, that brevity and clarity are supreme achievements. Always have your audience in mind, always, and never start writing without knowing what you're wanting to say and how you're gonna structure it. Don't forget to tell stories. Think and write like a proper human being. Illustrate with fresh examples and remember that less is always more. Have a think about good writers. Uh, think about what they do and 
copy their style rather than their substance because that could end you up in trouble, could be fatal to your career ambitions. Um, so I'd be interested in the chat to see who people think are great science writers, which uh, science writers, particularly popular science writers, have inspired you. And then my sort of top tip, when I was um, leaving academia and trying to write in a different style, uh, in plainer English, frankly, uh, I had a manager at one point who told me to read The Sun. Now, this may be absolute anathema to you, but in terms of people who can say what is said in a Guardian op-ed or a Telegraph op-ed in 2,000 words, they can do it in 100. And it's just really interesting to see the house style of the sun, how they can be so direct and clear. There's no fancy words. So that's one suggestion. If you can't bear the sun, even to pick it up when somebody's left it on a train, if you ever go on a train again, have a look at the New Yorker. Um, they have quite a bit of free content online. They do quite a lot of stories about science, particularly about climate change these days. And the emphasis in New Yorker uh, articles is very much around the scientist uh, and what he or she has done and how they got to that place in their career when they merit a profile in the New Yorker. So thank you very much, everybody, for your uh, patience. And I'm happy to um, discuss anything further. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I will do a formal thanks later, but um, first let's let's move straight on to the Q&A. Um, I can see more questions are coming in already, but I'm going to start trying to attack the backlog. Um, the, the, the oldest question that we didn't answer is a very general one. I just wondered if you might incorporate it a bit into some of your answers. Michael asked, could Sage have done anything differently during COVID? In some sense, the answer is obviously yes, <laughs> but um, any examples uh, from the, the most obvious science policy example in recent times, uh, fitting in with the other questions would, would definitely be appreciated. Um, but I, I'll, I'll move on to a cluster of questions um, about uncertainty, which I found very interesting. So um, uh, Garkai and, and Ellie both asked about what to do if you're talking about something that you're very uncertain about, perhaps environmental contamination from pesticides or the effect of climate change in the medium to long-term future, where you're, you're really very uncertain. And earlier, Victoria talked about, asked about um, whether in scientific writing we should eliminate conditional tenses to avoid ambiguity. So to what extent should we be using could be, would, might, and acknowledging our uncertainty, does that undermine the, the point? I think is the, the general gist. Those two are, are really, really good questions. And I think one of the really key developments in government, and this follows um, lessons from the uh, inquiries into weapons of mass destruction and Iraq, is that we are expected to put, uh, to use standard confident statements around things and when we say it is probable that this this could happen or it is highly likely that actually means something so highly likely means 85 to 95 percent probability whereas unlikely means I, I haven't got it memorized it means 20 to 30 percent probability I think the as long as you are putting uh, confidence statements, using confidence statements in the right way, the conditional tense is not such a problem because you are contextualizing that level of uncertainty. Um, but may's, might's and woulda, coulda, shoulda is problematic if, if you're not um, anchoring that in something. Um. I think, and then <laughs> some similar questions uh, or, or questions that lead on. And um, one from Rhiannon, um, she asked, how do you address the balance between blunt and accurate advice and uh, whether, uh, and the fact that your advice may be public and it may be available to the public who may dis misinterpret it or perhaps may be available to the media who, who may misinterpret it? Well, perhaps here I could bring in um, 
COVID because one of the main developments um, for SAGE, so I've um, been involved in SAGE for a few years. Our policy used to be that uh, SAGE advice would only be published after an emergency had been declared over. And the main reason for that was that um, SAGE advice is fed into ministers sitting in COBRA. And it is critical that ministers have space in which they can make the judgments that scientists never make on a particular issue um, without um, fear or, or favour. And if we are drawing on independent scientists who are giving advice to SAGE that we feed into COBRA, they need to feel confident and safe that they can give that advice um, without retribution. Now, uh, in relatively early stage of the um, SAGE response to coronavirus, um, it was felt that the advice we were giving was of such uh, intense public interest that we should start uh, issuing everything. And so um, from about April onwards, I think, uh, with a bit of a time lag to give uh, ministers the chance to review the advice we were giving and to think about other advice they were getting from other areas, whether it's economists or whatever, we would issue um, the science advice. Uh, and if you ever look at SAGE minutes, they are very carefully drafted. They do not give instructions because the the underlying principle is that the scientists provide the advice, none of them are elected, uh, none of them or few of them have any experience of taking uh, the understanding of the epidemic into developing a policy to protect people and to save lives. So um, those minutes are written very cautiously and they don't say things like, oi, sort this out, we've told you this already. Um, there has to be uh, humility, there has to be an understanding of how hard it is for the decision makers and the people that have to implement any science advice and that um, this is an extraordinary situation and that holds true for any of the emergencies I've been involved in, whether that's um, a dam at the risk of um, collapsing or Ebola in Democratic Republic of Congo or other activations that I've I've been involved in. Thank you. Um, we're getting a couple of questions about your career, which and I think that will be a very interesting topic of conversation. But just before that, um, I think people are, uh, are looking for maybe some specifics on um, on how. Well, I'll just say the questions and you'll get the gist. So earlier on, Charlotte asked about in structure how to bring in those un unknowns without undermining your points and, and how to structure your writing such that you recognize those unknowns. And then more recently, um, I think it was Ian said, you know, does brevity prevent nuance? Isn't nuance in also important? And Goulson has asked, um, could you give some specific advice on, on how to be clear and precise without being redundant or misleading? So broadly, it's, it's looking, I think the questions are looking for sort of concrete ideas about the balance between being brief and acknowledging uncertainty and acknowledging nuance and which is more important. Pretty difficult, I know. <laughs> so I, I don't want to, perhaps I've come across as, as too prescriptive. And I've said, if, you know, if you're writing to the treasury, if it's more than one page, it's going to go straight in the bin or something like that. That, that that's, that's not the case. Um, never let, um, you know, a template or a guidance be something that completely dominates. Um, so I think um, there is plenty of room for nuance in a short piece of writing. If you have, you have said to yourself, I'm not bothering with the throat clearing bit at the beginning. So let's say you're writing something about climate change and you said it's the greatest challenge we're facing. Um, it's just spare us that stuff. Everybody is on the same page about that. It's, it's the waffle and the um, easing yourself into your topic 
that in the nicest possible way, busy people can, can do without. It's, you know, what have you got to offer? Uh, and how, um, how confident are you in, in this? Um, or what, what is your suggestion? And I think it's interesting, there is more kind of crowdsourcing than there ever used to be for ideas on how to fix things. Um, a cabinet secretary um, who died recently, uh, Jeremy, I've forgotten his surname, uh, uh, sort of charity has been set up in his name, a competition for people, anybody to write in um, with solutions to hard problems in public services and things like that. Um, so we, 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 want, we want the idea, we don't want the sort of fluff around it. Um, I'm sorry, Richard, I've forgotten what the other two uh, questions were. It's all right. Um, it was talking about brevity versus nuance, but I do think yeah. we, we've mostly covered those things and there are a lot of questions. Forgive me, people, uh, if, if we don't cover every question in as, in as much detail as you might like. There's lots to get through. Um, so let's jump actually to careers now. Um, so uh, Denise effectively asks, sort of, how did you start your career outside of academia and, 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 and maybe talking about the transition? And Patrick is also looking for recommendations uh, for someone who has a humanities academic background, how to get into science policy and policy more generally. Okay, so in my case, I don't think any of it was by design. I, um, I was lecturing in American history, particularly in uh, racial segregation and African-American history in Durham. And I wanted to try something else. I wanted to make um, radio documentaries about America and race, and I didn't get anywhere. So I um, was a contractor in the civil service initially, and it took me a while to understand what roles there are in the civil service and what ones I wanted to, to have a go at. And the, the breadth of roles you can do is vast. And because um, there are some sort of very specific career paths you can take which require particular skills, whether it's in finance or operations research or communications, but there is just a vast number of generalist roles. Uh, if I can do a plug for the Government Office for Science, every year we have um, maybe 15 uh, internships, paid internships uh, in all different parts of of Go Science, and I can talk a bit about areas of work that Go Science covers, um, but uh, they tend to be for, um, there aren't really available for anybody who's still an undergraduate, but if you have done your undergraduate degree, it doesn't have to be in science, um, and you're interested in what is quite an unusual bit of government, because we don't have a minister that we're answerable to, we have uh, Patrick Valance, who's the government chief scientific advisor and is the equivalent of a permanent secretary. And we work to him. And our customers are number 10 and different departments who need a sort of independent science uh, advice um, for something that they're trying to figure out. So in most of the work that I've ever been involved in in Go Science, it's not the people within the department who generate the advice. Um, to give you an example, I um, led a report on the UK's vulnerability to um, loss or interference with GPS or GNSS, uh, Global Navigation Satellite Systems. We uh, assemble a group of experts from industry, from universities around the country, sometimes internationally, and we put them around a table and we start to figure out what the problem is and generate advice that way. Uh, one bit of Go Science uh, is the futures section and will be commissioned to look at, you know, obesity over the next 50 years or supply chain challenges that the government, that the UK might face um, in the future, or 
what does transport, public transport look like in 2070? Um, so, um, you know, I didn't come into the civil service as a fast streamer. I tried that when I was an undergraduate at Cambridge and didn't get through the system, but that's another very good way of getting in. There is now a science fast stream, which means that uh, when you're in those early moves between jobs, um, you will be put into uh, teams where there is a real science focus. Uh, and there are other ways of coming in. There's now a, a comms focused um, route in, there's a finance focused route in, there's a HR route in. And so um, if this sounds interesting, I would encourage you to look and they're hiring at the moment. And because of COVID, uh, it's no longer the case that you have to live in completely unaffordable London to do these jobs. They're creating uh, other hubs in uh, Cardiff and Manchester and Leeds and reviving other bits of um, other outposts of different departments. I can see people are putting some good things in the chat about different professions and um, the probability yardstick. Um, so thank you very much. Um, and coming back, these are just some questions I found quite interesting. Um, a recent one of Jonathan's um, asked, uh, when writing, when, when being a scientist, trying to write some sort of memo to a legislator, um, should you really just focus on the science or try and consider uh, sort of the human factor or, or issues around implementation of whatever you might be discussing or recommending? And this also linked back to a question from Garkai earlier, and, and they asked, is it worth getting something, uh, getting a non-expert to read something over first? And should we have always find a human interest angle to make it compelling? So they're both talking about human interest, one from the point of view of just sort of being persuasive, and then one point of the, from the point of view of maybe constructing better policy in and of itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, so if I take them in a slightly different order, Absolutely yes to getting somebody else to look at your work and uh, asking, asking them to tell you whether they understand it, whether it makes sense, whether it's interesting. Um, there will be some people in particular parts of government who will understand um, Blue Skies research straight away, but most people won't. And so the translational role, um, what this means uh, as a potential application is something that you should um, spell out as unambiguously as, as, as you possibly can. An earlier question that I missed um, from Rich, um, what are your views about writing as a group? Is it more powerful to write as a single voice or is it more persuasive when you have that consensus and that backing? That's a really interesting question. Um, when I was a speech writer, um, I didn't want anybody else to touch. This was all pre uh, sharing documents and Google Docs and things like that. I didn't want anybody else in the documents at the same time as me because um, when stuff is um, FOIable, uh, is sensitive, uh, version control is unbelievably important. Um, but um, yes, in, in the last uh, six months uh, or since August, uh, I'm no longer writing the minutes of SAGE and organizing SAGE meetings. I've been running a subgroup of SAGE looking at ethnicity and the disproportionate impacts of COVID on certain ethnic groups in the UK. There we have, in order to meet the timelines um, that we're set to provide input into SAGE, you do need maybe half a dozen people all writing a document simultaneously, a mixture of civil servants and independent academics in universities all around the country. And so there it's a godsend really. Um, but there will always need to be some sort of harmonization at the end, somebody who 
goes into the document and pulls it together, makes sure that it's consistent. Um, but again, you know, um, these papers that we've been producing, um, that there's been two steps to it really. We produce the paper and it goes to SAGE and the scientists who sit on SAGE understand the language. But then we have been tending to organize a teaching for policy officials so that they can ask any questions that they have directly to the scientists who drafted the paper in the first place. So if they're asking about you know, vaccine hesitancy among certain groups or whether there are any genetic predispositions which mean that some uh, minority ethnic groups are more vulnerable than others, it's much more helpful that they can speak to the scientists directly and other people can listen at the same time than uh, work their way through which despite what despite our best efforts might remain still a very very technical paper. Linking to that, I, th I think a, a, a slightly, a question that was a bit different from, from the others we've had, but I, I want to say because it might spark something. A while back, um, Dina asked, when considering a social problem connected with tech, uh, e.g. digital mental health care for survivors of abuse, is it better to focus on the tech or the social problem? And if I might widen it slightly, just then what you were talking about, it sounded like, to my mind anyway, um, that it might be that scientists might, and, and people associated in, in the science profession might tend to see problems from a very sciencey point of view. They've been trained in certain ways of thinking that might be very different to how politicians uh, might look at a problem, sort of the first thoughts that a politician would have, or indeed the general public might look at a problem and see something in a very different light to how scientists would see it. Do you think that's true? And if so, is there a problem there? Well, that's a, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And, you know, glancing at the chat, I can see that uh, Victoria said something about knowledge exchange roles. And quite often the issue is that, you know, people are coming from different worlds and the more they talk to each other, um, the more you can understand different people's priorities. So if you wrote with an idea about, you know, technology to answer a, a problem the response of a policy official would be first to say well what other solutions are there what's the cheapest um, what's the one that gives greatest value for money um, so um, i think like i said previously this is always worth spelling out the problem as clearly as you possibly can. Never assume that people are instantly going to grasp the full ramifications and potential of the amazing bit of um, coding you've done or the, the, the idea that you've, you've developed uh, in the lab. And you know, maybe to illustrate this, um, one of the things that we look for when we um, look for experts who could provide advice to SAGE is partly, of course, it's are you an expert in your field? Do you, are you an authority? But then are you comfortable with uncertainty and being asked to give an answer there and then on a particular issue rather than saying, I need two weeks to go back to my lab and, and think about that? And then thirdly, um, what diversity of experience and thought are you bringing to the problem? Uh, and we're more conscious than ever that what we don't want in SAGE, um, if we can avoid it, sometimes there's no alternative, is that um, the same people are there every time because then you get groupthink or the same institutions are present or people of a certain age, or background are always there because, you know, one of the revelations of um, you know, normal SAGE activation will have two or three meetings and involve 20 or 30 scientists. We're in the hundreds on this. And it's meant that so many more people, younger researchers who just happen to know about a critical issue have been brought into the fold. And we've seen how good 
people are from all sorts of backgrounds at different institutions, um, not necessarily scientists even, to answer some of these COVID questions. Thank you. Now, we have reached the, the scheduled end of the talk. There are two questions left and they're both excellent. So I will say them and, and hopefully you might be able to give something brief on, on each of them because they really are good. Um, Victoria asked, how do we reach ministers about long-standing issues, e.g. climate change, overseas development, when COVID dominates? And finally, Louis asked, this is the last question, what's the best, uh, if you'd write that one down first, Louis asked, what's the best written submission you've either received or produced and why? <laughs> Um, I thought they were both excellent, so. <laughs> um, so the first question on, on priorities, um, that, that is a real challenge. Um, at any time, whether it's for political reasons or, you know, just br brutal reality, certain things can, can move off uh, the agenda. Um, I would suggest thinking about your your local MP as a way to reach a minister if there's an issue that you're really concerned about. Because uh, in a private in a minister's private office, a letter from uh, a um, a fellow MP is 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 treated seriously. Um, uh, there is power in numbers. So, you know, the sort of uh, letter signed by 150 scientists to The Guardian or whatever uh, tends not to go unnoticed. Um, and I think You know, for, for somebody's career, and this applied to me when I was an academic, getting the stuff that contributes to the ref and proves that you're appearing in peer-reviewed journals is, is really important. But can you, can you do a, a public-facing version of the same thing in a blog or um, other ways to sort of have impact? Um, I think we're moving away from a world where the 60 page report is the dominant mode of conveying information, stuff is, is quicker and more fluid. And so some stuff like that can and does get noticed. Um, and then the last one, what's the best submission I've, well, I've never received one, I'm too lowly and irrelevant to ever having got one. Um, I think possibly, the best thing that I've written that has had impact was um, there is something called the Prime Minister's Council for Science and Technology. It's another thing that the secretariat for that is provided by the Government Office for Science. And it's a lot of very, very uh, clever and eminent people who have the freedom to write to the Prime Minister on absolutely anything. And uh, when I worked in that team, we uh, drafted a letter on um, robotics and AI in the UK and opportunities to um, strengthen UK capabilities. And uh, I wrote the letter on behalf of the experts that was sent to the PM and uh, it led to a big wadge of money in the budget uh, for uh, robotics and AI research and sort of translational facilities. So that was good. Oh, excellent. Um, we have reached the end. Thank you everyone for your patience. I will now just uh, wrap up and, and advertise <laughs> uh, a couple of our upcoming, upcoming things. But first and most importantly, thank you so much, Andrew, for what has been a really, really excellent, interesting, informative, <laughs> oh no, I'm, I'm being tautological and repeating myself, uh, a really brilliant talk. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Um, I've been getting lots of uh, messages in on the chat from other people who've, who've enjoyed it so much. 
the next thanks must go to all the participants. Um, we've had people from all over the country and, and, and people all over the world even. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been really great to have this, this sort of open event. This is the one, one of the few good things about doing it through Zoom. Um, I will just quickly share my screen um, and um, just highlight a, a couple of things um, for people who are keen to, to hear more from Cuspy. Next Monday, um, we have a, a talk from the lectures team on the economics and science of good en energy policy with Dr. Carrie King. That's not one to be missed. That's just an hour at six o'clock next Monday. And then the following Monday is maybe more relevant for people in Cambridge. Um, you may not know that Cuspy uh, every year runs with the Cambridgeshire County Council um, a, a policy challenge scheme where um, mostly PhD students, but uh, I think any, any researcher in the university is, is invited to, to volunteer a few hours a week and contribute to a, a real life policy pr problem that's facing the, the, the county and, and, and the city where they live. And uh, over the course of the year, come up with a solution to that problem usually. Um, and that event Monday week on the 15th will be uh, looking at the, the excellent solutions that have been come up so far for this year's pro uh, problems and uh, launching uh, the, the, the new event for next year, both definitely worth attending. Thank you all so much again. It's been so wonderful to have you all here and I just hope you have a nice restful rest of your evenings.